glad you are here. Uh, we are, doesn't look like it, but we are in the process of expanding the building one day. And uh, it'll happen at some points. We're working on that, but uh, you being a guest with us, we want to encourage you to be here. We love that you're here, and we will always make sure you have a seat. Uh, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about where things are at. The ball is still rolling, believe it or not. Uh, the ball is still moving, and us getting the expansion plans going. Yeah. Last week, we kicked off our annual series, our <coughs> annual theme of overflow. And I'll just ask you, so how'd that go? <laughs> Overflowing out of you over the last week. To keep that in mind all year long, that's why we have that on the banner for this year as a reminder of what flows out of us. And we'll talk a little bit about that today in some ways, but now this morning we're going to kick off our winter uh, Sunday morning series. We're going to talk about who we are and who God is. And ultimately, that's what the first few chapters of Genesis are about. Now, often we think of Genesis, we probably think of it being used for a number of other ways, rather than answering this question, sometimes try to use it scientifically or some other things like that. And really that's not the purpose of the first few chapters that you find in Genesis. In fact, if you're in Genesis 1, and I made that really hard, page 1, right at the start, you know, it's be tough to find. It's great when you can start right at the beginning of the Bible. And those first 25 verses, if you just scan your eyes over them, you will notice that it is a really short description about how everything came into being. And you would suppose if that the emphasis was on how all that happened and what is entailed and all of that and the details, imagine how much longer that would be. I mean, imagine how much longer you wish it was in describing, well, what did that look like and how did that all play out? And it's just amazing the amount of brevity that is given in those first six days of just laying out. There's life, there's vegetation, there's animals, and it's just rapid fire, boom, 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 boom. And in those first 25 verses, you notice that there are ultimately two repetitions, and those are really the highlights of what God wants us to see as it describes the creation sequence. The first repetition that is just unavoidable is it will just constantly say, and God said, and then he says something. And the point being, everything that was made comes by the mouth of God. That God spoke it into existence. And I could make a whole sermon series out of that because if you think about the scriptures, all of the scriptures hang on the idea that only God gives life. God gives life through his word. God creates through his word. God restores through his word. And that's all being established right out of the gate. God says, and there's life. God says things come to existence. It is the power of God's words that he just merely says it, and it happens. And not only is that repetition found, but you'll notice another repetition. Nearly after everything is created, you will have this statement made, God saw it was good. And so now you double down on the idea that everything God creates, he creates by his word, and everything he creates is good. Everything he does is good. Everything he says is good. And so that is your, your warm-up into the pinnacle of what chapter 1 is all about. After describing the sequencing of the universe and all of the details, two big points. God said it, and it was good. And then you'll notice, as was just read for us in verse 26, things change when we come to that point. Now the creation sequence shifts, and now you have this very long narration about humans, where we suddenly now have this statement, God said, and it isn't just God said, let there be humans. If that were the case, it would have fit the rest of the sequencing of creation. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be animals. God said, let there be trees and vegetation. God said, let there be humans. But he doesn't do that. 
In verse 26, God speaks to himself. God said, let us make man in our own image. Sudden break in the sequencing of creation. Something different just happened here. And it is being highlighted in regards to the statement that humans now are made in the image of God. There's something different about them. There's something unique about them. And God even has this discussion here of making them in their very likeness, in their very image. And it's highlighted again in verse 27 that God created them male and female and they are created in the image of God. Now, volumes have absolutely been written answering the question, what does it mean that humans were made in the image of God? That has been a struggle for centuries. So people have tried to figure out, all right, well, what is entailed by this idea that humans are made in God's image? And I think there's validity to the declaration that has often been written and made that humans are able to reason. They have self-awareness. They have a conscience. They possess spiritual discernment. They're able to mirror the attitudes and expressions and character traits of God. And this is clearly some of what God is getting at. But one of the things that I think is extremely important to observe is the context tells us a great deal about it, what it means for us to be made in the image of God. And so I want to look at it again carefully and notice what is being highlighted about humans that's distinct from the rest of creation because that gives us then an insight into what it means for us to be made in God's image. Genesis 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the bird, or over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You will notice there is a double repetition. First, God says, let's make people in our own image. And then coming right after that is, and let's give them rule and charge over all the creation. Then verse 27, you'll notice the sequencing of the creation. In fact, your Bible might have it set differently. When your Bible sets things differently, that's poetry. And so here is this poetic, and so God created them male and female. And then notice verse 28, now God turns and charges them and says the very thing of what was this was about. To be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue, have dominion over all of the creation to rule over it. Now you may be asking an important question. What does ruling over the earth have anything to do with being made in the image of God? Why is that stated? Let's make him in our image so that he has rule and is able to, to have that and subdue it. Creates them and then tells them, be fruitful, multiply, subdue it, rule over the earth. In Ancient Near Eastern times, there was an interesting idea about how they saw an image. The uh, cultural background of study Bible describes it this way that I thought was succinct and useful. Throughout the ancient Near East, an image was believed to contain the essence of that which it represented. That essence that was equipped to equip the image to carry out its function. If I were to summarize what a lot of other writers have observed and been looking at the ancient Near Eastern texts, the idea of an image was that it would represent the king not necessarily in its appearance, but more in its authority. That's why the image would exist. In fact, they would even kings would put images of themselves in various lands to show this is my realm, this is my region, I rule. 
We even still use that today. We have all kinds of things that bear an image that represent the authority of something. Even back in ancient Near Eastern times, bearing the image of a king, maybe of something that they would seal or be on something that they would state or declare or have their image there, represented their authority. It represented who they are. And that's the idea of what's happening here in describing that we were made in the image of God. Think about what God is showing here in this picture in these three verses. Is declaring humans to essentially be God's representatives. I'm going to put you on the earth and you are going to represent God. Acting on God's behalf, reflecting God's character in how you rule over the earth. That you will have dominion over it, you will subdue it, you will be in charge of it. But you are not going to have that authority indiscriminately. It's not that, okay, humans have been put on the earth and you do whatever you want to do. No. You're made in the image of God. You're representing God. You are in His image. And you are being placed on the earth then to be able to represent the authority of God, to represent the rule of God. In essence, then, right out of the gate, after all of the creation sequence is done, I want you to consider that ultimately what God then tells humans is, in everything you do, I want you to represent me. In everything you do, you're going to represent me. You are going to reflect my image. You none of the rest of creation, but you humans, you represent the image of God. You were made in God's image. And therefore, who you are, what you say, what you do, how you act, all of those things are supposed to be representative of the fact that you're in God's image. You were made by Him. And I think that's an important picture then for a number of reasons. We're going to talk quite extensively about what that would look like, but I hope you will think about how liberating this idea is that you are made in the image of God. One of the things that I think is so liberating about this is because we live in a world right now that is trying to define what makes a human valuable. What gives it its worth? And for the longest time, that's been the struggle. What makes you valuable? Is it what you look like? Is it the job you do? How much money you make? How much power you have? How much success you are able to accomplish? There are all kinds of litmus tests that have been laid out. Perhaps it's what people think of you. That determines your human value. Or maybe if you're married, you have value. Or how many children you have. Or now how many children you don't have. Or You notice the world is always trying to quantify this idea of human value. You're important because you have a lot of stuff. Or you make a lot of money. Or you're at the top of your job. Or you're the best at what you can do. Or you have a zero carbon footprint. Or you have a thousand carbon footprints. Or whatever it is, the world's trying to quantify what is that human worth? What gives you your value? And we're seeking that. And what is liberating is that your value is not based on what you do, or how much you make, or how much you don't make. Or how many children you have, or if you're married or not, or if you're a success in your job, or if you have a lot of power, if you make a life-changing device, or whatever it is. You have value because you were made in the image of God. That's the defining achievement. The reason you have value is not on what you do, or how much you change the world, or what you make but is that you are made in the image of God. You've heard me say this before, I'll say it again, but this is ultimately what I mean by 
we should not be thinking about self-esteem, but about God-esteem. Because what I mean by that is when we do self-esteem, what are we thinking about? What have I done? How much have I made? What have I accomplished? Am I important? What do people think of me? Am I a success? Do I influence? That's not value. God says that's not your value. God esteem says, I made you. That's why you're valuable. That's why you're important. Is because I made you and I made you in my image. That is the great value that has been given us. And it is a liberating idea. To understand that your value is immovable and is not changing based upon your career or how good you are at something or how terrible you are at something or these life choices you make doesn't change your intrinsic worth and value to God because God made you in this image. That changes then a lot of things that we think about then because being made in the image of God means. Everybody has equal rights and equal value. Everybody has equal rights and equal value. What God does in describing that is ultimately levels the playing field. Because if there is no God, then how are we supposed to measure ourselves? How do we define worth if there is no God? And I suppose, want to put before you, it is when we have taken God out of that thinking that you see all of the problems of society arise. Because now, the powerful are more important than the oppressed. Because see, now we don't have equal rights and equal value. It's based on who you are or what you do or how much power you have or success. See, once we move it away from the intrinsic value of God, saying you are made in his image, now the problems begin. Because I go, okay, Mike makes right. I'm stronger than you, so I'm going to do whatever I want to to you. What are you going to say about it? I'm stronger. And if there's not this intrinsic human value of being made in God's image, there's nothing to stop that. That's why the rich will harm the poor, the mighty get away with injustice. It is only when we recognize that every single person is made in the image of God, and therefore every person has equal rights and equal value regardless of gender or race or color or power or wealth and the like. It's only because of that intrinsic truth that we can have that. It doesn't matter what you look like, what you've done, what you haven't done, what you've accomplished, what you haven't. Because we are all on an equal playing field. We were all made in God's image. So it doesn't matter how different you look or how much more money you have or how much more success you have or how much more power you have. We're all equal because we've all been made in the image of God. And see what happens when you take away the image of God as the defining picture of rights and value. What are we going to define it by? And that's what it turns into wealth and power and success and color and all these kinds of things. That's when we wreck what God was trying to establish. And I think it's important that we establish that idea even further. Because humans are made in the image of God, that means no human is higher than another. No human is higher than another. I'm going to just pause right here because this I don't need the rest of the scriptures. This changes everything right here. With all of us being made in the image of God, every single human being, Here's then what we can deduce. Any action that harms or devalues another human is sin. I could have just stopped at Genesis 1 and been done and said, clearly then any violation of what is good and right and wholesome and helpful to another human being, that's the sin, that's wrong. Because we were all made in God's image. I don't need all the other laws. It's bound up in the very idea. You're made in the image of God. And therefore, we're on an equal playing field. And it doesn't matter what you look like. 
This is why our world has become upside down. This is why slavery is a sin, prostitution is a sin, abortion is a sin, and sex trafficking is a sin. I don't have to have a verse. Anything that harms or devalues another human, that's sin. Because we were all made in the image of God. And that has to be the controlling thought process of the picture that God is trying to give to us. Not only does it change how we look at one another as humans, it changes how we even look at the creation. Humans then are more valuable than anything in the creation because we were made in the image of God. We have been set apart by God. That's what the creation sequence does. 25 verses, just a few verses to each day, blowing through how God made, God said, God made, God said, God made. And then there's this halt of the story. And it all then goes, but humans have been made in the image of God. And there's something unique and different about them. None of the rest of the creation, look through those first 25 verses. None of the rest of the creation is said to have been made in God's image. There is something special that is given to humans, that nothing else is given the rule as God's representatives over the earth. It's important to say this because of the air we breathe and the culture that we're in right now. That means the ground is not equal to in value or worth to humans, nor vegetation and trees, nor animals. Humans were made in the image of God. And there is an improper order that God has put forward then. That humans stand on top of that. Now that again doesn't mean, okay, we're humans. We get to do whatever we want to do. No, no. We already covered that. We represent God. As being given the charge of ruling and subduing the earth. And we have a charge to reflect God. In what we do, in what we say in the earth, we're supposed to be that bearer of God's image. But again, it is important to identify that humans then are placed on top. I, I don't think I ever would have seen such amazement about those things. Except that's our culture now where that's a struggle. It's a struggle to understand that. That humans and animals being placed on the exact same level of, of rights and privileges is an unfortunate thing that's occurring right now. Humans are made in the image of God. And that doesn't mean that we do not take seriously what it means to reflect God's image. But there's a reason why human life is put up at the highest of levels. Why God lays that out again and again. We'll see that in a couple of chapters. As we're made in God's image. We are set apart as different. Than that. And not only than that, let me push it a little bit further. Because hey, if you're going to get in trouble, let's go all the way. Verse 27 tells us something important as well. God created mankind, man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God made both male and female in the image of God. There is nothing superior intrinsically about men or women. They're both made in the image of God. I'm going to save a lot of this for chapter 2. But it's stated right here. Made in the image of God. There is nothing here that speaks to any kind of inequality between males and females. In fact, I would put forward that any historical ugliness that has ever occurred in regards to male and female relationships and dynamics are unbiblical and they're not godly. Right here out of the gate, male and female both. Made in the image of God. Same value. Same value before God. So important that we embrace that.
It is important that we understand then that women have equal dignity, equal value, equal worth, equal respect, equal care, equal destiny. I don't know how we've moved away from that. Both made in the image of God. There is not a distinction there. Male and female, he created them both in the image of God, which in seeing that, I hope that would help us embrace what God has made us, whether it be male or female. I think some of the struggle that is going on in our society about this is because there has been such a battle between the genders of who is superior, who is better, the, all the battling over that. I think some of it comes from false definitions of what it means to be male and female. You, know, you can't be a man if you cry. <laughs> okay. You know, women can't like football. Okay. What are these false constructs that we have come up with that define what it means to be a male and to be a female? Here's the construct. You were made in the image of God. That's what matters. Embrace that. Embrace how God made you. There is not supposed to be this warring or battle between the two. But I'll talk about that next Sunday. Instead, I want to zero in on verse 28 because ultimately, this defines the mission. The question of the lesson is, why are we here? And the very first chapter is putting this forward. Here's why you are here. Here's what it's all about. Here's what you are here to do. Verse 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. What's he say? You are God's representatives and you that are to fill the earth with the image of God. Think about that marvelous idea. God creates got light, sun, universe, stars, planets, vegetation, trees, waters, animals. And then God comes to humans and says, now I want you to fill the earth with my image. I want you to represent me throughout all of the earth. To use and rule the earth as a display to God's greatness and glory. That here you are being put everywhere. Just think about it. Rather than putting little statues all over the earth that were in the image of a king who would say, this is my land. What God does is he creates humans and says, you're in my image and I put you over all of the earth because all of it belongs to God and you will represent me. You will represent God in how you act. In what you say and how you rule over the earth, you represent me because I am the ultimate king and I place you as my image bearers. And I want you to fill the earth with the image of God. One of the things that I found interesting in research this is even in the ancient texts long, long ago, there was concern about overpopulation. So Ecclesiastes was right. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> I thought that was a more modern concern, you know, 7 billion people. Even way, way, way long time ago, we've got writings of overpopulation of concern. Notice what God's answer to that is. Fill the earth with my image. I want you spread everywhere, showing my glory and goodness across the earth. Now, if you think about that long enough, that's a little bit disturbing, isn't it? Because as humans, how are we doing in being image bearers, displaying God in all the earth? We've totally messed that up. We've completely wrecked the mission. The mission right out of the gate from God. You're made in my image. Be fruitful, multiply, rule on my behalf. Show God to the world in how you behave and in what you do. 
This is ultimately what the New Testament is about, is what God is doing through Jesus, is restoring that image. I don't have time, but there are passages like this in Ephesians chapter 4, and verses 23 and 24. You remember Paul says, I want you to put off the old self and put on the new self. But what's the rest of it? Created after the likeness of God. Here's God restoring the image we've broken. 2 Corinthians 3.18 does the same thing. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to another in this image. He'll later on call them ambassadors of Christ. It wasn't an ambassador to do, but represent. You are God's representatives. You stand before the world representing God. But we've broken the image. We were made in the image of God. Sin wrecks the image. That's chapter 3. There's your head headline coming. Jesus restores the image. So what I want to do is just end with this idea for us as we kick off this series from Genesis. Who are we? Why are we here? What's it all about? We are made in the image of God. And what that first should mean for us is that changes how we look at other people. It should change everything about how we look at other people and how we look at ourselves. Other people were made in the image of God just like you. And we are not better than anybody else, and they are not better than us. We are all equal because we are made in the image of God. It doesn't matter how much money somebody makes or doesn't make. It doesn't matter what somebody looks like. It doesn't matter if they're good looking or not good looking, if they're popular or not popular, if they have success and power, if everybody knows their name across the planet or not. Everybody is made equally in the image of God, and no one is superior to any other person. And that should change a lot about the dynamics of relationships with people if we keep that in mind. That person's made in the image of God just like you. So how will we deal with a bunch of people? who are created in God's image. It should change everything about how we treat one another, how we act, how we behave, what we say to other people. We would not have any kind of superiority on any kind of level whatsoever. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter what your background is, your social status, your economic status. It just doesn't matter. Who cares? We're made in the image of God. That's all.